Hi, welcome to an online copyright tutorial. My name is Alan Kilpatrick and I am an MLIS candidate at the University of Western Ontario. Today we're going to be looking at fair dealing. This tutorial was originally presented as part of a larger presentation I did on behalf of the Faculty and in Information of Media Studies Graduate Resources Centre called Access Copyright, What Does It Mean for Western? A Librarian's Guide. Today, we're going to be taking a look at fair dealing. Specifically, we're going to explore three points. What is fair dealing? How is fair dealing defined? And CCH in the six fair dealing criteria. What is fair dealing? Fair dealing is the right, when fair and reasonable to do so, to copy a substantial portion of a copyrighted work without permission from the copyright owner or payment to the copyright owner. Fair dealing is a user's right, and it's an exception to copyright infringement. An integral part of the Copyright Act, any act falling within the fair dealing exception, will not be copyright infringement. So whatever fair dealing is, it's not copyright infringement. Here's what the Supreme Court had to say about fair dealing. In order to maintain the proper balance between the rights of copyright owners and users' interests, it must not be interpreted restrictively. To go to the idea of copyright balance, copyright owners' rights are qualified by certain copyright users' rights. Fair dealing is a user's right, and it's like a counterweight to owners' rights that helps balance copyright. How is fair dealing defined? The Copyright Act does not define fair dealing or explain what would be considered fair. So how do we know what would be fair or unfair? Well, fair dealing has been clarified over time through judicial decisions and court cases. And we look to these judicial decisions for guidance and clarification on fair dealing. Historically, fair dealing has been interpreted narrowly and restrictively by the courts. This all changed in 2004 when CCH Limited sued the Law Society of Upper Canada. The Law Society of Upper Canada Library had been faxing research articles to its members off-site and providing self-service photocopiers. CCH Limited, which is a Canadian publisher of legal textbooks, alleged that this was copyright infringement. Ultimately, the Supreme Court held that the actions of the Law Society of Upper Canada Library fell within fair dealing. This was a landmark Supreme Court decision. CCH was revolutionary for Canadian copyright law. It broadened user rights, explicitly expanded the scope of fair dealing, and provided significant clarification and guidance on fair dealing. The Supreme Court established six criteria to help copyright users assess whether their copying falls within fair dealing or not. The Supreme Court explained the purpose of the dealing, the character of the dealing, the amount of the dealing, the nature of the dealing, available alternatives to the dealing, and the effect of the dealing upon the original work, that these are factors that be, may be more or less relevant to assessing the fairness of a dealing. These six criteria are, are a sort of a framework or a guide, and evaluating your copying in light of the six criteria can help you determine whether your copying falls within fair dealing or not. So we have purpose, character, amount, alternatives, nature, and effect. And we're going to take a look at each of these six criteria in detail. The first fair dealing criteria to consider is the purpose of the dealing. Section 29, 29.1, and 29.2 of the Copyright Act states that fair dealing for the purposes of research, private study, education, parody, satire, review, criticism, and news reporting do not infringe copyright. These purposes are like categories and they are, they are very broadly construed. Ask yourself, is your copying for one of these purposes? Going back to the idea of copyright balance, in the interests of maintaining that balance, the Supreme Court indicated that these purposes should not be interpreted restrictively. For example, research must be given a large and liberal interpretation. It's not limited to the creation of new facts or data, and it does not preclude more general 
classroom instructional purposes. Private study is not limited to study in isolation. For example, it could involve study in a group, study at the direction of an instructor, or study in the classroom. It might also include consumer research, lifelong learning, and study for personal interest. Beyond this, ordinary definitions and our understanding of these words can help define these categories. However, the eight fair dealing purposes are categories, and this is a categorical list. Section 29, the Copyright Act, explains that fair dealing for the purposes of research, private study, education, parody, satire, review, criticism, and news reporting do not infringe copyright. Your copying must fall into one of these eight categories. If it does not, it's not fair dealing, and that's the end of it. The Supreme Court made these categories very broad, and it gave them a low threshold for entry, meaning it should be relatively easy for your copying to fall into one of these categories. If your copying does fall into one of the eight allowable fair dealing categories, proceed to consider the five remaining criteria. In the remaining criteria, character, amount, alternatives, nature, and effect, you can analyze and assess the fairness of a dealing. To recap, in the first step we consider purpose. If your purpose falls into one of the eight allowable fair dealing categories, we can proceed to analyze and assess the fairness of the dealing in the remaining five criteria. The second fair dealing criteria to consider is the character of the dealing. So there are two points to consider when it comes to the character of the dealing. The number and distribution of copies and the past practices at your institution. When considering number of copies, if you are distributing multiple copies of a work widely, this may be unfair. A single copy for a specific legitimate purpose may be more likely to be fair. The court also indicated it's relevant to consider the customary and traditional practices in a particular trade or industry when it comes to determining what is fair. Now this is a very important point. The practices of the academic community in general and our actions here at Western can help shape what is considered fair under the law. If we work to exercise robust fair dealing rights here at Western, we can expand what might be considered fair. At the same time, if we don't exercise fair dealing rights, we are essentially narrowing what is considered fair. The third fair dealing criteria to consider is the amount of the dealing. When considering amount, we consider the portion being copied in relation to the entire work not the overall amount copy. There's no set formula, quantitative measure, or amount to determine how much of a work can be copied fairly. I can't say, for example, that it's fair dealing to copy up to 10% of a work and that it's unfair to copy more than 10% of a work. There's simply no magic number like this. How can we determine how much of a work can be copied fairly? Well, we can exercise individual judgment. Does the amount you want to copy seem reasonable? Then it's likely fair. And it might be fair to copy an entire work in some cases. It might not be possible to deal with a work unless you copy all of it. For example, a poem, an article, or a work of art. Now it's the copyright owner's right the copyright owner's sole right to reproduce a substantial portion of a copyrighted work. And fair dealing is the right, when fair and reasonable to do so, to reproduce a substantial portion of a copyrighted work without permission or payment. The copyright owner does not have the right to control the copying of insubstantial portions of their works. And we copy insubstantial portions of works all the time in the academic community. For example, quoting a few sentences in an essay is an example of insubstantial copying. If we are copying an insubstantial portion of a work, we can copy it automatically without really even thinking about copyright. 
Now, how do we determine what is substantial copying versus insubstantial copying? Well, we can exercise individual judgment again. If the copying seems insubstantial, then it likely is. We have one more point to consider when it comes to amount. Amount is not determinative of fairness. The amount does not determine whether something is fair dealing or not. It is simply one of six fair dealing criteria, and any fair dealing analysis should be based on all six of the criteria. The fourth fair dealing criteria to consider are the alternatives to the dealing. This criteria is like a test of necessity. Simply ask yourself, is it necessary to copy this particular copyrighted work? Is it necessary to copy this amount? And does a non-copyrighted alternative exist? If it's necessary for you to copy a particular work, and it's necessary for you to copy a particular amount to achieve an intended purpose, then it's likely fair. The fifth fair dealing criteria to consider is the nature of the work we would like to copy. For example, it might not be fair to copy excerpts from a confidential work the author never intended for public release. On the other hand, copying excerpts from published academic or scientific articles published with the intention of disseminating knowledge and ideas that may favor fair dealing because you are helping to disseminate those ideas with your copying and copying from an unpublished work may tend to be fair as well. Your copying could help disseminate the knowledge contained in that unpublished article, and that could be seen as a benefit to society. The final fair dealing criteria to consider is the effect of the dealing on the original work. If the copy you create is likely to compete with the commercial market of the original work, this may, might be unfair. It's crucial to note, however, that while effect is an important factor, it does not take precedence over the other fair dealing criteria. The, cr the commercial effect is not more important than the other criteria. It's simply one of six criteria established by the Supreme Court, and a fair dealing analysis should be based on all six criteria. Now in a recent Supreme Court case, from July the 12th, Alberta versus Access Copyright, the court overwhelmingly dismissed Access Copyright's claim that copying short excerpts in schools for educational purposes had a negative effect on the market. The court explained that proof of harm to the market of the original work needs to be demonstrated to turn this criteria to unfairness. General claims of lost textbook sales is not enough to make this criteria unfair. To stress, for this factor to be unfair, there needs to be demonstrable proof of harm to the market. I would like to leave you with four points about fair dealing before we end today's copyright tutorial. Fair dealing is flexible and open to individual interpretation. Work through the six CCH criteria on a case-by-case -case basis to help assess whether your copying is fair dealing. Our past practices and present actions can help shape what is considered fair under the law. If we work to exercise robust fair dealing practices, we can help shape what is considered fair here at Western. And finally, Check out the Queen's University Library Fair Dealing Evaluator if you need help applying the six fair dealing criteria. This tool is a great way to evaluate your copying in light of the six criteria in a very concrete way. Thank you for watching today's copyright tutorial, What is Fair Dealing? If you have any questions about copyright, please feel free to contact me by email, on Twitter, or at my blog. Thanks.